Welcome to Through the Bible. I'm Steve Schwetz, your host on this five-year journey through the entire Word of God. And as the Bible bus stops by the 26th chapter of Isaiah, our teacher, Dr. J. Vernon McGee, begins our study with the Song of the Kingdom. That's in verse 19. So while you find your place in God's Word, Greg Harris and I have got a few letters to share with you from our fellow listeners in Eastern Europe. Yeah, an important part of our ministry, uh, post-communist, it's been a few decades, but there's still a lot of lingering effect of communism and, and the, the negative effects it had on countries that we'll be praying for. If you're on our world prayer team, you will be getting stories and information and prayer requests on countries this week like Belarus, Romania, Latvia, Hungary, and the Czech Republic. Yep. And like other parts of the world, Through the Bible plays an important role both for believing Christians in this area and helping them to grow in their maturity and understanding, helping them to unwind some goofy doctrine that yep. has a way to fit itself into into any form of Christianity when there's people and sinners around, and yep. those are usually occupying the same body, but that's another <laughs> subject. So, And and as a, as a gospel outreach, and yes. Through the Bible's had that kind of impact, not just in the U.S., but in this part of the world yeah. as well. And we here's here's just some evidence, some fruit of that from uh, Hungary. Years ago, I received a Bible, and my wife and I started listening to your teaching on a regular basis. It was wonderful to walk with the Lord. The church in Sheged, which apparently is the third largest city in the country of Hungary, hmm. uh, the, the church in this city welcomed us with love and we rejoiced together nearing my 76th year i thank the lord for forgiving me and embracing me does anyone need a miracle more than that hmm. i ask the lord's blessing on you all wow such an encouragement and yeah. here's an example of someone coming to the lord as a part of exactly. the program exactly and then growing deeper and walking for many years yep. yeah here's another testimony your programs are a great joy and edification for me when i first started listening i could not pray in my own words i did not know that it was possible to get in touch with god in this way but since then i've learned from my dear brothers and sisters how to worship the lord jesus christ and pray to him thank you and, you know, Steve, I, uh, we were reading letters earlier this month, and I was thinking about this. Sometimes we get a glimpse into uh, how little solid teaching is even available to yeah. people. Things that, not that we're much more mature or so smarter than other Christians around the world. We just have a lot more resources, good preaching, teaching. Yes. And so often through the Bible may it be the only solid, balanced teaching they're going to get for something like learning to pray in your own words. Yeah. How about this next one? You want to read that? Sure. It says, I'm grateful for your messages and for your prayers. My earthly family is a constant source of sadness. The special bond in Jesus I have with you is more concrete than that of my earthly family. Thank you for the online interactions in prayer and Bible study groups. Wow. And <laughs> again, I am always struck by how real the letters are that we yeah. get. People aren't trying to you know, present this little perfect view of their lives. They, they're they honest. And, and for a lot of people, family is a great source of pain, disappointment, yeah. and they're bringing their real problems to us and to the Lord. And yeah. I think that's a, an awesome part of what God does through this ministry. Particularly when you're the only believer in your oh, family. Yeah. And, yeah. and oftentimes, if you're part of a, a Muslim family, there yeah. is a whole lot of friction, more so than in other, other religions and cultures, to name the name of Jesus. Yes. And that can be very difficult. I also like... I wish we knew more here. It says, thank you for the online interactions yeah. in prayer and Bible yeah. study groups. And I wonder, is this one of the people that use WhatsApp, you know, as it, part it of the group? Be. Is it something on Facebook? Yeah. Is it, since it's, it, it, we're talking about, you know, Eastern Russia, is it Kontakta, which <laughs> yeah. is the equivalent? And anyway, we can go on and on. <laughs> Greg, we're almost out of time. Why don't you pray for us as we begin our study in Isaiah? Father, we rejoice uh, in the work you're doing in Eastern Europe, Central Europe, all around the world. Thank you that we get to give out your word, to give the bread of life to hungry souls around the world. We pray you'd continue to use our humble efforts to bless many of the millions of people that long to know you. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's get to our study in Isaiah 26 on Through the Bible with Dr. J. Vernon McGee. Now, friends, as we come today to the 27th of Isaiah, many of you recognize that even in a five-year program, we have to move along. And we dealt with the 26th chapter rather hurriedly, as you recognized last time. But I want to drop back to verse 19 in the 26th chapter and pick up 
something there that we should not pass over so hurriedly. In fact, we're just not going to pass over it without having something to say about verse 19. And let me read this. It says, Thy dead man shall live together with my dead body shall they arise. Awake and sing, ye that dwell in dust, for thy dew is as the dew of herbs, and the earth shall cast out the dead. Now put with that the wonderful fact that these people are looking back during the time of the kingdom here on earth. The fact that they went through the great tribulation period, and as they went through the great tribulation period, it was like travail of a woman with child. And now they are in the millennial kingdom. And he goes on to say here, thy dead shall live. Now this is, as it were, the voice of Jehovah breaking into the prophet's reverie as he looks back. Thy dead shall live. Well, who's dead? Well, obviously, I think it's the nation Israel. That's what he's talking about in this chapter. And he continues, my dead body shall arise. Now, some interpret this as the national resurrection of the nation Israel, as it's used in Ezekiel 37, where we have the valley of dry bones as the counterpart. Well, others, they turn to Daniel 12, 2, where the resurrection there is definitely individuals. Well, somebody says it's not both national and individual, is it? Well, I think actually it refers to both. Why? Well, it's difficult to have a resurrection of a nation as suggested here without having a resurrection of the individuals who constitute that nation. I don't see how you could have a resurrection without the resurrection of the individuals. Now, these dead are now included in the hallelujah chorus, and the word is awake and sing. Now, the thing that impresses me about the millennial kingdom here upon this earth, you and I are living on an earth that's actually in one sense, and if you want a doleful picture of it, it's a cemetery. They're dead everywhere today. Cemeteries everywhere. And there's not a moment of the day or night but what there is in a procession on the way to the cemetery. Now, that's not something to think about all the time because it's not a pretty picture. But God says this earth was never intended to be a big cemetery. He's going to stop that trend and he'll reverse it. He's bringing back from the dead not only the saved, but the lost, and they're being brought back for judgment. The whole thought here is that this earth that you and I live on will never have a dead body in it throughout eternity. That's going to make it a pretty nice place to live. Now, as we come here to chapter 27, we have the third wonderful song of the kingdom. And we had it in 25 and 26. And now the kingdom is concluded here, the coming of the kingdom. And the chapter brings to a conclusion the threefold song of the kingdom. And I want you to notice the way that we've divided it. You have first the song of the vineyard in the first six verses. Seven through 11, the smiting of Israel and her enemies. And that's contrasted. And then the sure return of Israel to the promised land. And that is confessed. Now, will you notice this? That would be verses 12 and 13. Now, verse one, in that day, that projects us immediately into the future. We have said that day is a technical expression that refers to the day of the Lord, the day that begins as a Hebrew day did with the evening, the time of the great tribulation, and it goes on into the millennial kingdom. And personally, I think on into eternity because that's the sunrise that's never going to end. Now, in that day, the Lord with his sower and great and strong sword. What is the Lord's sword? Why, the word of God. It says, when the Lord Jesus comes out of his mouth, goeth a sharp two-edged sword, and with it he'll smite the nations. Does he have a literal sword there? And that's what an amillennialist said to me. You take everything literal. You think that is a literal sword? I told him, I said, you know, when I discover that 
the tongue is like that. It's really a sharp thing. And that the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. That I take it that it's the word of God by his word. And that's all God has to do. By his word, he created all things. By his word, he shall judge. And who is he going to judge? He shall punish Leviathan, the piercing serpent, even Leviathan, that crooked serpent, and he shall slay the dragon that's in the sea. Now, we have here the punishment of Leviathan. And I think, frankly, that this verse really belongs to the end of the last chapter. But that's, again, a technical point, and I don't care to enter into that discussion. But the important thing to note about this verse here is it's in that day, and it's in that day at the beginning of the kingdom that the Lord Jesus, who at that time will bring judgment upon the serpent, Leviathan. Who is he? What's Satan? And he is to be put in the bottomless pit for a thousand years, we're told. And I think that we can identify it as Satan. We're told the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the earth. His angels were cast out with him. That's Revelation 12, 9. And now we find in Job 41, 15, and 17, I'll not read it except to say his scales are his pride. You see, they were for his protection. And Satan thinks he's invulnerable, that he cannot be touched. And this leads, of course, to the pride of Satan. He doesn't realize, I take it even today, that he can be judged. He thinks probably he's beyond the judgment of Almighty God. And by the way, there are a lot of people like that, you know. Many people think today, there's no judgment coming. They poo-poo the idea. And that's a satanic thought, by the way. And what you have here is a reference to that. And I probably should call attention to the fact that several of the outstanding interpreters, including Dalich, they think of him as Satan, but also as referring to the Tigris River that snakes in and out, and the Euphrates River, and the Nile River, and the Tigris River, the nation of Assyria was there. Babylon was by the Euphrates River, and Egypt was by the Nile River. And this works out. Back of these nations, the kingdoms of the world belong to Satan anyway. I think this is a marvelous figure of speech we have here. Now, the chapter actually begins with verse 2. Listen to this. In that day sing ye unto her a vineyard of red wine. Now we're in the millennium. You can sing now, and I'll be able to sing then. I've been interested when I mention the fact in Psalms, I wish I could sing, but I can't sing. I've had any number of people that have sent me an original composition that they've written and wanted me to sing it. Well... I can't even sing the old-time religion very well, and that's the only one I really know. Now, will you notice? It's a vineyard of red wine here. That speaks of abundance. It speaks of fruitfulness. It speaks of bounty. It speaks of joy. And by the way, this is a contrast to Isaiah 5. In that, we have the song of the vineyard, but it was a dirge because That vineyard was Israel, and God was going to judge it because it hadn't brought forth fruit. But now we're in the millennium in this abundance of fruit. Why? Because, verse 3, I, the Lord, do keep it. I will water it every moment, lest any hurt it. I will keep it night and day. Now, this ought to tell somebody that God is not through with the nation Israel. These are passages of Scripture that everybody passes over. I'm confident many of you will say, well, I never heard this on radio before. Maybe you never heard it anywhere. But this is a passage of Scripture makes it clear God's not through with the nation Israel. Now listen to him. Or let him take hold of my strength that he may make peace with me, and he shall make peace with me. Now the enemy can make peace with God even in the kingdom, for God never ceases to be merciful. Thank God for that. He's rich in mercy. He's got plenty of it. And I need a lot of it myself. And grace is something. We'll find out that 
10 million years from today, why, grace will be there for us. And we're going to need it, I think, even in heaven. Now, we have a strange expression here. Oh, let him take hold of my strength. That's verse 5. That he may make peace with me. Now, this is the only place in Scripture where it's even suggested that man can make peace with God. Now, you hear that a great deal today, make your peace with God. My friend, what can you do to make peace? He has already made peace, and Paul says in Romans 5, 1, therefore being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. This is the only place in Scripture which says to make peace, and this happens to be in the millennium. So today, friends, you don't have to make it. He's made it. You don't make peace. We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. When you are ready to agree with God and trust Him with what He's done for you when Christ died on the cross, you will have peace. And brother, you won't have it until then. He says that. I didn't. Verse 7, Hath he smitten him as he smote those that smote him? Or is he slain according to the slaughter of them that are slain by him? Now, this verse here opens with a question I think it's already been answered here in Isaiah. And it's this. Why does God persecute Israel more than he did the other nations? And when I say persecute, let me change that. Why did he judge them more, more severely? Well, I come back to this. Light creates responsibility. In view of the fact that Israel had more light, her sin was blacker and her punishment was greater. She received more stripes than the nations who smote her. You remember, God says in Amos 3, 2, You have I known of all the families of the earth, therefore I will punish you for all your iniquities. Her punishment was severe, but God did not destroy Israel as he did some other nations. In Psalm 118, 18, The Lord hath chastened me so, but he hath not given me over to death. He will not let them be destroyed. Verse 9, By this therefore shall the iniquity of Jacob be purged, and this is all the fruit to take away his sin when he maketh all the stones of the altar, and so on. The sin of Jacob was purged by a blood offering, and the sin of the nation will be expiated by the blood of Christ. Just as you got saved as a sinner, That's the way it will take place in that day. Anyone that says today, oh, God is through with them. I don't know why they don't read passages of Scripture like this. Now we have here the cities that Israel built, though are to be destroyed like any city that man apart from God builds. Today, I don't think we're seeing fulfillment of prophecy. But those of you that see the ruins, for instance, of Masada, What a judgment. There has been nothing like that in the history of the world. Now, I can't go into that, but that was a judgment from Almighty God. And why? Because they rejected light. They not only rejected light, they rejected the person of the Son of God. Now, verse 12, And it shall come to pass in that day, and we are in this period now, verse 13, It shall come to pass in that day that the great trumpet shall be blown, and they shall come which were ready to perish in the land of Assyria, the outcasts in the land of Egypt, and shall worship the Lord in the holy mount of Jerusalem. And they're going to come out of Russia in that day. We're not seeing fulfillment today. My friend, when God moves them, God will move them, and they'll come and worship God. Just as he's called you and me, he'll call them. This section reveals definitely that God intends to restore the nation Israel to the promised land, and I have no argument with those who deny it. I just say this to you. It's not even a question of whether they're going to be restored to the land. It's a question whether you believe the Word of God or not. And if you believe the Word of God, what are you going to do with a passage like this? May I say, you can't spiritualize it, because he's talked here about Assyria Egypt, Israel, and Jerusalem. My friend, 
These are literal places. God says they are to be literally restored. You want to do something with that? Well, my suggestion is if you say you have a high view of the inspiration of Scriptures, then believe what God says. Chapter 28. Now we come to the immediate invasion of Ephraim. That's the northern kingdom by Assyria, and it's a picture of the future and a warning to Jerusalem. We've ended one section now, and this chapter brings us to an entirely new section. The prophecies, which were totally future, that we've been looking at, they were in chapters 24 to 27. Now from chapter 28 through 35, we have prophecies which have a local and past fulfillment. We've had both in the past. Now we're going to see them brought together in a marvelous way. And they reach into the future. They cover the same period as the previous section. Now we have six woes in this section. And when you say woe six times, it's time to woe. Only this is W-O-E. And it culminates in the great battle of Armageddon, or the war of Armageddon, I should say, in chapter 34, and it's followed by the millennial benefits brought to the earth in chapter 35. Many know about chapter 35, but not much about 34. Now, this particular chapter that we're in now, 28, it's a fine illustration of the combination of the near and far view of prophecy, the past and future events, that which has been fulfilled, that which is to be fulfilled, that which is local and immediate, and that which is general and far distant. Now, the northern kingdom of Israel is designated here by the name of Ephraim, and it was soon to go into Assyrian captivity. And it was in 721 that Shalmaneser, king of Assyria, invaded the northern kingdom, and he overthrew the kingdom, took the people into captivity. That's what's before us. We have here the immediate coming captivity of Ephraim. Verse 1, Woe to the crown of pride, to the drunkards of Ephraim, whose glorious beauty is a fading flower, which are on the head of the valleys of them that are overcome with wine. Now, this is the northern kingdom, and the thing that has brought down every nation has been liquor, has been alcohol. The drunkards here are literal drunkards and those that are spiritual. And when they're spiritual, they are filled with pride and drunk with pride. They're in a stupor as far as spiritual understanding is concerned. Now you have here the crown of pride, verse 3. The drunkards of Ephraim shall be trodden underfoot. Maybe you don't like that. But God never apologized for it. He just told us that's what he did. And the prophet picks up the figure of the drunkards here and this high level of civilization that had been developed in the northern kingdom. And friends, all you have to do is to go to the hill of Samaria where you have the palace built by Omri and by Ahab. And that's where Ahab and Jezebel live. You know, it's interesting. The Lord always gives the wicked and the rich the best places to live in this world. And I think it's poetic justice. It's not going to be so good in the next world. So they get it pretty good. That is the most beautiful spot in that land. I stood on the hill of Samaria. I couldn't get there last time because Israel really doesn't have the land. The soldiers were there, and it was a dangerous place to go. But on the hill of Samaria, I have stood... I've seen the Mediterranean Sea, the Jordan Valley, Mount Hermon covered with snow in the north, and the walls of Jerusalem in the south. Friends, you couldn't have a more beautiful place to live. And if a real estate developer develops that hill and sells lots, I hope I can get one and put me a little house there. I wouldn't mind living there. Great place, by the way. But God judged these people, and this high civilization... God brought it down. Now, out of that, he moves to the future, verse 5, in that day. And so we've got to move it to the future, that is, till next time. So until then, may God richly bless you, my beloved.
As we break for the weekend, join me for more great teaching from Dr. McGee on the Sunday Sermon. Now this week, he's going to present the second part of his message from Isaiah 11 and 12 titled, The Millennium versus the Great Society. For listening options or to be in touch with us, just visit ttb.org or call us at 1-800-65-BIBLE. Again, that's ttb.org or 1-800-65-BIBLE. I'm Steve Schwetz, and I'll be here next time saving a seat for you. We look forward to your company in God's Word. Jesus came Through the Bible is a five-year study of God's entire Word, and together we discover God's purposes in history and our lives, found only when we believe in Jesus Christ. Do you know Him yet?